Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases, although this year I do want to branch out, so I guess my intro may need a little rework. Anyway, today we are going to be discussing a solved case from South Australia about a mum, dad and their 16-year-old daughter who lost their lives in a truly horrific way for absolutely no logical or explainable reason. As always, my sources are linked down below. And a friendly reminder, I discuss cases on this channel based on available news coverage, books, documentaries, etc. I am not a journalist, just someone with an interest in researching and reading up on local cases, and I attempt to cover each case on this channel with as much respect for the victim or victims as possible and with as little bias as possible. My videos are not opinion pieces, nor are they presenting new information in any of the cases discussed, unless stated. Having said that, let's get into it. And side note, I am still working on a new background. This isn't permanent. I'm not super happy with the setup right now, but I did recently move house and... I'm still trying to sort it all out. So today we're heading all the way back to the year of 2010 to the small mining town of Kapunda, located near the famous Barossa Valley in South Australia. There on Harriet Street lived the Rowe family. The Rowe family consisted of 16-year-old Chantelle Marie Rowe, her older brother Christopher Rowe, 25, and their parents Andrew Peter Rowe, aged 45, and Rosemary Joy Rowe, aged 44. The Rowe family had only moved to Kapunda a few years before the following events took place, and by all accounts, they were a normal, happy, and well-liked family. At the time, Chantelle also had a boyfriend named Dylan Pratt, who she had been dating for several months. On the morning of November 8, which was a Monday, the bodies of Andrew, Rosemary and Chantelle were found deceased in their home. The oldest row child, Christopher, was away on holidays in Queensland with his fiancée at the time that the bodies were discovered. Tragically, Christopher would learn of his family's passing through social media. He saw news coverage reporting the passing of three individuals under strange circumstances on Harriet Street, where he lived. Up until this point, Kapunda had not really experienced any serious crimes, let alone a potential murder investigation. So this story was big news. The town was so small and quiet, in fact, that only two police officers lived and worked in the town when these crimes took place. Christopher Rowe posted to his Facebook page asking if his family was okay. He was initially told by a friend that they were fine, but he would later learn the tragic truth. When the news of the three deaths began to circulate the media, the full details of these crimes were kept under wraps. The investigation was trying to avoid a, a panic, I guess, in this very small town, whose population sat at just over 2,900 as of 2016. But news soon broke that police were in fact investigating a triple murder. And not only was it a triple murder, it was the triple murder of a mum dad and their 16 year old daughter. As details began to emerge, the town of Kapunda and the state of South Australia were not only in a state of shock, but fear. Who would do this to a family that appeared so nice and so normal? So I'm now going to discuss more about the crime scene and the injuries sustained by the Rowe family. These attacks were incredibly brutal in nature, so if you want to skip ahead, this is your warning. The crime scene itself would later be described as blood-soaked, 
and the attacks as frenzied. From the beginning, investigators believed the attacks must have been personal due to the severity of the injuries. Andrew Rowe was found with a total of 29 stab wounds, and Rosemary at least 50. It was believed Rosemary was attacked on two separate occasions, and they were both attacked with knives from their own home, indicating the attacks had not been premeditated. The knives, however, were not found at or near the crime scene, and would in fact never be found. The force of the attacks on both Rosemary and Andrew were so severe in nature that fragments of the knives were later found in their bodies. A neighbour later admitted to hearing Rosemary scream help three times shortly after 1am and hearing what sounded like someone falling to the floor shortly after that as well as a male voice shouting. This neighbour did not report the incident however believing it was simply a family argument or disagreement and didn't want to get involved. Aside from this neighbour's account, nobody else saw or heard anything that night. The crimes themselves, by the way, were believed to have taken place on the Sunday evening, November 7, or in the early hours of the Monday morning. And as I said, the bodies were discovered on the Monday at around 11am, although I couldn't seem to find any information as to who discovered the bodies. There was also, by the way, no signs of forced entry into the home, a possible indication that they knew their killer or killers. Lastly, we have the youngest member of the Roe family. At just 16, Chantelle was found in her bedroom with at least 33 stab wounds and had been sexually assaulted. Strangely, Chantelle was also found in fresh clothing, meaning her killer had taken the time to remove her blood-soaked clothing and redress her before fleeing the scene. The sexual assault aspect of the crime also led investigators to believe that Perhaps Chantelle was the key to finding their killer and her parents had simply and tragically just gotten in the killer's way. It also appeared that the killer had made a feeble attempt to clean up the very messy crime scene before fleeing. Luckily, investigators were able to extract some pretty solid evidence from the crime scene. Fingerprints were found on Chantelle's bedroom door that did not match Chantelle nor her parents. Although unfortunately, when these fingerprints were ran through the national database, no matches came up. They were also able to lift a DNA profile from the semen found on Chantelle. But like with the fingerprints, no matches were found. The investigation soon turned its attention to the male friends and acquaintances in Chantel's life. They set about speaking to those that knew Chantel and asking them to submit for sampling. Although it seemed unlikely that a teenage boy could be behind such callous and vicious attacks, it seemed like a pretty good place to start the inquiries. Chantel's boyfriend, Dylan, of course, was questioned as part of this investigation. Dylan told police that at 5.30am on the morning of the murders, he messaged Chantel asking how she was feeling, as she had been quite unwell the previous day. He said he never got a reply, but phone records on Chantel's end showed someone did try to reply. However, since Chantel was out of phone credit, the reply never sent. It's also likely that whoever tried to reply was not Chantel, as she was almost certainly deceased by 5.30 that morning. Dylan was quickly ruled out after this inquiry as he had a solid alibi. Investigators then began looking into the movements of the Roe family leading up to the murders. 
On the Saturday before the attacks, Chantel had a small gathering of friends at her house where they ate snacks and watched movies, just typical teenagers hanging out. While her parents were away in Adelaide for the night attending a party. The following day, Chantel and her parents had a family lunch where they took photos together on a digital camera. These photos would later become key pieces of evidence, but we will circle back to that later. Police also set about questioning all the friends that had attended Chantel's Saturday evening gathering. Everyone questioned was very helpful and anyone that was asked to submit for sampling complied. It was during the questioning of Chantel's friends that a new name came up, Jason Downey. Jason was mostly a friend of Chantel's boyfriend, Dylan, but also a friend of Chantel's, although he had not been at this gathering on the Saturday. Although his name was brought up, nothing specific was mentioned about him and he didn't stick out to investigators as a potential suspect but still he was added to the list of acquaintances to inquire with. As the investigation continued as it always happens rumors began to swirl as to who committed these awful crimes and why. One of the rumors involved Andrew Rowe and the fact that he owned a motorcycle. Reports began coming in that perhaps Andrew had connections to bikey gangs or drug activity based on him owning a motorcycle, which is a pretty big jump. These rumors though were quickly quashed and this theory was ruled out. Another rumour circulating was that Chantel was pregnant, with several media outlets reporting this as a fact. But again, this was very quickly proven to be untrue. So as I mentioned, police set about questioning Jason Downey. It was less of a questioning or interrogation actually, and just more of a general inquiry, asking what, if anything, he might have known. The same kind of questions all of the Royal family's friends, family and acquaintances were asked about. And of course, this was a chance to ask him to submit for sampling. During these questions, Jason Downey began to form his alibi for the night of the murders. Despite the fact he was never even asked for one as he wasn't even a suspect. On top of that, he started talking about how he wasn't invited to Chantel's gathering on the Saturday and started going on about the fact he didn't have a girlfriend. Again, all information the police never asked him for. Uh, and a hot tip, in any kind of criminal investigation, if you're being questioned whether you're guilty or innocent, don't provide police with additional information they didn't ask for. You're going to start to look guilty whether you are or not. And that is exactly why investigators began to take a closer look at Jason Downey. Although the scrawny 18 year old at just 52 kilos or 114 pounds was an unlikely suspect. Plus he had been pretty helpful during the questioning and had been compliant when asked to submit for sampling. Although investigators did notice that Jason had a number of cuts on his hands. When asked about these, he told them that he had fallen off his push bike. On Sunday, November 14, one week since the murders, Jason Downey provided his DNA sample. Two days later, on the Tuesday, the results came back. Jason Downey was a positive match to the killer. So police quickly set a plan in motion to have Downey arrested that day. But they knew they had to be smart in their tactic. After all, they didn't know what mental state he was in or what he was capable of. Considering the severity of the murders, it was hard to say what 
he would do. They had to execute the arrest in a place that would not endanger the lives of others. So they contacted Jason Downey's work manager. Downey worked as an apprentice mechanic at the time and asked him to pass on a message to Downey that stated he was required to just swing by the police station that evening and sign his statement. Just very casual, no big deal, but they needed him to come down that day and do it. Pretty standard protocol. Downey agreed and dropped by the Kapunda police station after work that evening. Upon arriving, he was informed that he was under arrest. During his initial questioning, Downey told police that he had had consensual sex with Chantel months earlier. The police, of course, informed him that this wouldn't account for the fact that his semen was found on Chantel months later at the crime scene. But Downey just seemed to brush past this and started coming up with more excuses and explanations as to why his DNA may be at the crime scene. A suppression order was also put in place following his arrest in order to try and conceal Downey's identity. However, his name and image quickly spread across the internet and the suppression order was soon lifted. During Downey's early court appearances, he maintained his innocence, despite DNA to the contrary. But before we get any further, you're probably wondering who the heck is Jason Downey and what was his connection to the Roe family? And most importantly, what motivated him to commit such heinous and, and hateful acts of violence against three innocent members of a family? So Jason Alexander Downey was born in Kilmarnock, Scotland, and had immigrated to Kapunda, South Australia, with his mother Lorna and brother Jamie six years before the attacks. He also had a half-sister, Jodie, who lived back in Scotland that he did keep in regular contact with. Downey was raised by his mother after his father left when he was two months old. He was a sports fan and loved horror movies, but what he did not appear to like was where he lived, Kapunda, calling it Krapunda on his social media. He also wrote on his social media that he enjoyed quote, partying and hanging out with friends. I love my sports. I am very active on and off the basketball court, if you know what I mean, end quote. Downey also stated on his social media that he was popular and that his worst fear was not seeing his family, many of whom were back in Scotland and he had not seen them for several years by this point. As I mentioned before, he was friends with Chantel's boyfriend, Dylan, but as it turned out, Downey had a bit of a crush on Chantel. Actually, it was far beyond a crush and more of an obsession. Jason would hassle Chantel on Facebook and even drove past her house on the regular. From what I understand, Chantel somewhat ignored his behaviour because he was a friend of her boyfriend's and she didn't want to cause any issues. It should also be stated that at no point did Chantel give Downey the impression that his feelings were reciprocated or give him any indication that she was interested in being with him in any way. The day after the murders, Jason Downey showed up to work, although late, and asked to leave early upon hearing about the deaths of the Roe family, claiming he was overcome with grief. He also took the next day off work, again citing grief. Five days after the attacks, TV camera crew were filming a makeshift memorial where people had been leaving cards, toys and flowers in memory of Andrew, Rosemary and Chantel. They captured footage of one particular teenage boy who was by himself. He laid down his own card with a teddy bear before standing by himself in silence for a few minutes to observe the other tributes that had been left behind. 
This person, it turned out, was Jason Downey. Downey had the absolute nerve to go down to this memorial and not only pretend to look totally and utterly grief-stricken, but bring something to leave as a tribute. What Downey left at the memorial was a small grey teddy bear with a rose and a card addressed only to Chantel. The card read, to Chantel, may you always be remembered and never be forgotten. You'll be missed by everyone. Jason Downey, X, X. Truly sickening. Seeing this footage of him at the memorial and the photo of the bear and the card actually made me sick to my stomach. Jason Downey is the definition of pure evil, as far as I'm concerned, and in my opinion has zero remorse. I am going to discuss the why in a moment, by the way. Not that there is any logical explanation as to what he did. So I want to quickly go over how the investigation believes that the attacks played out. According to Downey, he entered the house through a bathroom window, although we only have Downey's word on this. He could have entered through any door window or maybe he knocked and asked to come in. It's believed Downey went there looking to have sex with Chantel, or at least to confront her about how he felt. But upon entering the home, he encountered her parents, who potentially told him to leave. At some point, Jason Downey snapped, grabbed a knife from their kitchen, and began stabbing Andrew, followed by Rosemary. After this, he headed to Chantel's room. Chantel had very likely heard the attacks on her parents and was hiding under her bed, no doubt scared for her life. Downey then dragged her out from under the bed, and began stabbing her before he sexually assaulted her. Before leaving, as I mentioned, he removed Chantel's blood-soaked clothing and redressed her in fresh clothing before leaving her on her bed. Before fleeing, Downey attempted to clean up the crime scene, and it was during this time that he noticed that Rosemary was still alive so he launched into a second knife attack. At some point before he left, Downey removed his shoes, leaving only his socks on, and left behind some bloody footprints. He ditched his shoes not too far from the crime scene, and these were later recovered, but as I mentioned, the knives were never found. During Jason Downey's time in custody, he continued to maintain his innocence, in particular when speaking with his mother and brother. He told his family his own version of events from the night of the murders that went as follows. Danny claimed he had been driving by the Rose house for some reason on the night in question when he saw blood on their walls. He said he immediately stopped his car and ran inside where he found Andrew and Rosemary dead. He then says he found Chantel barely clinging to life. She apparently asked him for help, but soon after died in his arms. Downey told his mother and brother the real killer was dressed in dark clothing and carrying a green shopping bag. So instead of calling the police after this gruesome discovery, and apparently even seeing the killer with his own two eyes, Downey fled claiming he was terrified. The police would never believe his version of events. I can't imagine why they wouldn't. Meanwhile, investigators were gathering even more evidence and building up a solid case against Jason Downey. Aside from the DNA evidence found at the crime scene, bloodstains found on Downey's car console matched that of Rosemary and Andrew, 
and a USB stick attached to a lanyard that belonged to Chantel was found in Downey's possession. And police knew for certain that Chantel had this USB stick and lanyard on her just hours before the attacks because that digital camera I mentioned earlier with photos of the family lunch taken that Sunday of the murders showed Chantel holding that exact same USB stick and lanyard. Chantel's laptop also had a failed login after the time of her death and bloodstains on the keyboard. Although this in particular didn't prove Downey's involvement, the rest of the evidence did. Blood on Chantel's bedroom door also matched Jason Downey. In November of 2011, exactly one year and one day after the murders, Jason Downey finally pled guilty to the murders of Andrew, Rosemary and Chantel Rowe. This guilty plea was likely a result of overwhelming evidence combined with the fact that a guilty plea came with a reduced sentence and not because Downey felt any kind of remorse for his crimes. Although Downey had pled guilty, the details of the murders still had to be detailed in court in order for the judge to reach an appropriate sentence. During court proceedings, Justice John Sulan stated, quote, to describe the attack on these victims as a savage attack does not adequately describe what happened in that house. End quote. What's interesting to me in this case, or disturbing I should say, is that the killer had an incredibly weak motive. A crime of this nature, fueled with this much hate, feels like it should somehow be explainable. Not to say that there is ever an excuse to murder someone, but how can somebody so young with no criminal background commit such a violent act. This case does somewhat remind me of the Granoff family massacre I covered about a year ago here on the channel. It was about an entire family brutally killed by someone they barely knew. Jealousy of course can be a very strong motive, but Chantel Rowe and Jason Downey were never involved. It's as though something in him just snapped that night. Justice Sullen also stated to Downey during proceedings, quote, the circumstances of what occurred are chilling and they are all the more chilling because you do not exhibit any of the criminological characteristics of many people who came before the courts, end quote. Which I think sums up how many of us feel about this case. There seems to be no obvious or apparent reason psychological or otherwise, for Jason Downey's actions. The only explanation offered in court was that Downey was motivated by a sexual obsession with Chantel. Downey's lawyer, Greg Mead, stated, quote, The explanation is as old as humanity itself. Ordinary, unremarkable, common jealousy. Faced with resistance from Andrew and Rose Rowe, he seems to have lost control. He obviously went completely berserk that night, end quote. His lawyer also claimed that Downey had no recollection of the actual attacks. In my opinion, this is a piss-weak explanation. Jason Downey was such a weedy little teenager that it almost defies logic that he was able to carry out such brutality against three people. Maybe something did overtake him that night, but whatever it was, was truly a force of evil. In April of 2012, more than 100 family members and friends of the Roe family showed up to Jason Downey's sentencing. Downey ended up being sentenced to a non-parole period of 35 years, one of the highest sentences to ever be handed down in South Australia's history. Upon hearing this news, Downey barely reacted. 
Given he was just 20 years old at the time, it means he could potentially be a free man by his mid-50s, which is still young and plenty of time for him to begin a brand new life. Downey could still potentially get out, have kids, get married, start a career, travel. Andrew, Rosemary and particularly Chantel will never get this second chance in life. Not to mention that this sentence equates to about, what, 11 and a half years per life taken? Is that all each of their lives was deemed to be worth? Yet again, a spectacular failure of the Australian justice system. Why even set a non-parole period when the crime carried out is this horrific and this violent? When you commit a crime like this, you should lose your right to freedom forever. In one final blow before he was sentenced, Jason Downey wrote a one-page letter to the friends and family of Chantel, Rosemary and Andrew. Just like the card he wrote to Chantel that he left at the memorial, this made me feel beyond sick. It was a letter obviously written to clear his own conscience. Even the way he doesn't address anyone in particular, not even Christopher, is sickening. I will have the letter on the screen now, but I'll also read it out for those of you listening. It starts, as I said, to all the friends and family of Chantel, Andrew and Rosemary Rowe. First of all, I would like to apologise for my recent actions of November 8, 2010. From the bottom of my heart, I am deeply sorry for my actions. I have hurt a lot of people for what I've done. I know that no matter what my sentence I may get, it will never be enough. I have caused so much pain, not only in my family, but many others. I know this apology may not mean a lot to a lot of people. I feel that I have to say sorry as this whole situation is eating me alive. I had a career, car, friends and most importantly I had family. Now due to my recent actions I have nothing and as much as I hate to say it but I deserve anything and everything that is going to happen to me. I take full responsibility for my actions. I would also like to apologise to the brother of the victims, Christopher Rowe. I can't imagine what he would be feeling as he lost the most important people in his life. I want you to know that if I could turn back time and fix my wrongdoings, I would do it in an instant, but unfortunately I can't. Once again, I sincerely apologise for my actions from the bottom of my I'm truly sorry. Dated Jan 20, 2011. I mean, have you ever heard a more me-centric letter in your life? He says, I feel like I have to say sorry, as this whole situation is eating me alive. <laughs> I mean, honestly, f off. He then had the nerve and audacity to list all the things that he had lost in his own life. Friends, career, his car, like that matters? I'm sorry, but are you freaking kidding me? And to refer to the murders as my recent actions? What the f***? Who even passed that pathetic letter on to anyone? Why didn't they just burn it? I can't tell you how angry I got reading that letter, but I am going to stop here before I go on a tangent. I do genuinely hope though that Jason Downey is suffering every single day of his existence in that jail cell. And given his size and somewhat notoriety, I'm sure he's a target of at least a few of the other inmates and wouldn't that be a shame. Anyway, that is it for me today. Thank you for being here and for listening to the Roe family's story. Until next time, stay vigilant and stay safe.